Well, welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Michael Rivera. I'm the CEO of the Association for Corporate Growth Los Angeles. And I wanna wish everybody a, a warm welcome uh, for joining us today. Uh, today, we're going to hear uh, about ESG, environmental, social, and governance, and, and why it matters in, in the middle market. We're joined by Alex Bernard, who's a director at Marsh and McLennan Companies. Um, and an interesting topic today, and I think one that is uh, increasingly weighted and factored in, uh, in the middle market deal-making community. Um, and, and so, Alex, I know we've got a lot of content to get to. Uh, a, a quite an interesting presentation that I, that I was able to preview uh, and then reserving some time at the end uh, for Q&A. And so for our viewers, um, if you would, we're going, to, we're going to hold questions till the end. Please do put them in the chat function uh, and, and uh, Sheena Nickerson with ACG Los Angeles will collect those uh, and then moderate a brief Q&A at the end of uh, Alex's presentation. So with that, Alex, let's, let's get started and take it away. Thanks so much for joining us today. My pleasure, Michael. Thank you for that introduction. I'm gonna share my screen here uh, and provide just a, a bit more background on, on who I am and, and Marsh McLennan, just so that you all are aware of the perspective from which these comments are, are arriving. Uh, so uh, I've been with Marsh McLennan for 16 years at, in various different roles and, and Marsh McLennan, ticker symbol MMC is uh, a large professional services conglomerate that it owns Mercer, uh, which is uh, among other things, the largest investment consultant in the world for, for institutional investors. Uh, Guy Carpenter and Marsh, uh, Guy Carpenter is a reinsurance firm. Marsh is the, you know, the one of the largest commercial insurance brokers uh, in the world. Um, and Oliver Wyman, which is a leading management consultant in the financial services industry in particular, but, but in other, other sectors as well. Um, and across the, the four businesses at, at Marsh McLennan, we, we have various levels of ESG expertise and uh, that, that apply to different aspects of, of the, the private equity value chain, as it were. So what I, what I hope to do here, barring in part from my experience working at Mercer previously as the head of responsible investment uh, in the North America region, uh, is to provide a broad overview of the ESG topic uh, for general partners uh, like yourselves. And uh, here's a broad outline of what we'll be covering in the next 20 to 30 minutes and, and the following Q&A as, as, uh, as there are questions that, uh, that, that arise. Uh, first, we're gonna start with an overview of what sustainable investment is. Um, there'll be some historical views there as well as uh, some, some prospective views. We'll then look at the asset owner perspective. So what is it that asset owners are looking for? Uh, when, when it comes to ESG, how are they incorporating ESG into their asset allocation and manager selection processes specifically? Uh, then we'll look at the, the at point two here at the general partner perspective, really looking at a total portfolio view for a private equity fund. Uh, how, do you, how do you look at risk management across the portfolio and scenario analysis? What are some of, the, some of the tools being used in that context? And then we'll look at the individual asset level uh, briefly at, at uh, how ESG factors or, or ESG uh, risks or, or scenarios are influencing valuation and or how they you know, might be a factor in human resources based decisions that are, that are being made in your portfolio companies. So with that, I'll, I'll start with the overview of the sustainable investment landscape, which can be a bit of an alphabet soup for, especially for the unindoctrinated uh, there's a lot going on there. And so what I find is helpful is this very basic spectrum of, of the direction of travel in the sustainable investment arena. What we saw in the you know, 80s and, and, and well, even before then um, was a, a push on what we called socially responsible investment then, and, and SRI investment still very much exists today. But the, the push there was really around divestment. It was trying to align portfolios with values by excluding companies that were, were anathema to those values from, from portfolios. And uh, there are well-known movements, anti-apartheid, uh, anti-tobacco, now anti-fossil fuels movements, which have, have continued to push and in many cases very successfully for the divestment of those types of, of securities from, uh, from portfolios. Uh, at using screening and, and also stewardship or engagement me mechanisms as the primary means of, 
of fomenting that that kind of change and, and action in portfolios. That that was uh, very much you know an important movement, and there are still quite a few investors that that have. Uh, perhaps don't have as strong of a fiduciary view, uh, or but are, are you know are more focused on, on say you know delivering on a mission, uh, or our family offices and, and have um, are managing third party money. Uh, a lot of values oriented investors in the in those in those segments. Uh, what we see now is that the SRI movement evolved and has evolved pretty strongly into what what more broadly known as the ESG environmental, social, and governance investment movement. Which is really focused on value generation rather than values alignment. And value generation generative approaches tend to be somewhat opportunistic. And so you can see that all the different methods here screening, uh, ESG integration, thematic investment, or stewardship are all employed by ESG investors in an attempt to enhance value to, uh, to their customers by you know, increasing alpha or, or return potentials in whatever way, whatever way necessary or possible based on, based on the context. And so screening, we talked about a bit, I mean, that's, that's otherwise known as divestment. ESG integration is simply the incorporation of ESG factors into investment processes um, alongside traditional financial factors to try and uh, derive ideally an alpha signal uh, through through their incorporation and thematic investment is really about investing in line with thematic trends that that environmental and social um, uh, issues may be may be creating uh, and so climate change is is a, probably the most well known uh, such thematic trend but many others uh, exist in our in our growing uh, as well and now we're also seeing a growing movement of of what are what are called impact investors so investors that look to both generate market rate returns and a deliberate social or environmental uh, outcome that is positive. And the impact investors re remain a relatively small cohort relative to you know, the size of the ESG marketplace, which is you know, by some measures, 30 plus trillion dollars uh, in, in asset center management globally. Um, but nevertheless, they, they punch probably above their weight in terms of asset center management insofar as the uh, a big portion of the responsible investment movement or industry is moving in the direction of, of impact, trying to be more deliberate about the fact that all of the investments we make uh, have an impact, whether we acknowledge it or not, and, and being more deliberate about measuring what that impact is and trying to figure out how to, how to make it positive wherever possible. And so increasingly, we're going to see more and more emphasis on this impact point. But for now, the, the market is really focused on ESG um, as, again, as a value generative uh, approach to, to investing. And one of the things that is driving this uh, and is also in some respects sort of necessary in order to, uh, in order to actually achieve appropriate ESG integration is a shift away from what's often referred to as sort of shareholder capitalism towards more stakeholder oriented capitalism or, or views of, of, of management that are more stakeholder aligned. And what, what stakeholder oriented investors uh, will do, well, it, and it, uh, importantly, I think it's important to emphasize at first that there's, there's, uh, those two perspectives are often viewed as, as in, in contrast to one another or, or mutually exclusive. Uh, but what, what we argue and what, what an increasing you know, amount of, of literature seems to argue is that uh, is that they're actually not. They, they tend to be overlapping. The, the big issue really is around time horizon and, and knowledge of the quote unquote non-financial uh, aspects of, of, a, of a business. And so what a stakeholder oriented uh, company or investor will look at is, the, is not just the impact of the, uh, of the company's management techniques on, on share price, but, but also the impact of the company's management on internal and external stakeholders and there's a panoply of, of those types of, of, of stakeholders, as well as broader society and environmental impacts. Um, and in order to do this successfully and marry the sort of shareholder uh, value maximization idea with this with the stakeholder um, viewpoint, it's important to place greater emphasis on ESG and also uh, perhaps most importantly, to emphasize uh, a longer time horizon or to, to evaluate and, and invest on a longer time horizon. And this certainly aligns well with the private equity uh, you know, theory of, of a liquidity premium and, and the, the, the benefits of, of owning companies privately uh, through higher, usually higher control stakes. Um, all of those things lend well to adoption of a stakeholder view and to, you know, successfully marrying these two, these two perspectives and, and achieving long-term value creation for your investors and for broader society. And what's driving all of this is really, it comes down to dollars and cents in the end. 
And what we've seen in, in the literature, most of which is retrospective, my, you know, mind you, uh, is that ESG integration has been and and its and its sort of affiliate strategies or approaches uh, has been broadly positive uh, to financial outcomes. And there's a you know an often probably oversighted at this point uh, meta analysis which which was conducted by the UN Principles of Responsible Investment and the University of Hamburg uh, back in 2015, which has been updated in, in the year since, which found that over 90% of the 2,000 or so studies that they surveyed in that meta analysis. Uh, found a, a non-negative correlation between ESG factors and company financial performance, um, meaning that less than 10% of the studies showed that ESG integration led to a loss of returns uh, relative to, uh, to, to some sort of a benchmark. Uh, and so this perception that has persisted for a long time, really since the you know, divestment movement started in, the, in, in earnest in the, in the 80s, um, if, the perception that ESG reduces returns is just flat out empirically not supported at all. Uh, and in fact, the opposite is much more true that there are uh, way more examples of positive outperformance in the investment literature uh, than underperformance. Uh, and then there are a variety of other reasons too for, for wanting to take this, this movement seriously. Uh, regulators are starting to enforce and, and require ESG integration in various forms. You know, Europe adopted in March of, of this year uh, parts of the uh, of the EU taxonomy law, which which are now requiring managers, as, as, as some of you may be aware, if you're part of a multinational group, um, if, which with exposure in Europe, uh, they're requiring adoption of of certain ESG uh, comply or explain and actual uh, measurement rules, which are pretty strong. And, and there's you know thousands of other <laughs> examples of policies that have impact on financial services. Uh, globally and more coming online uh, every day in, in, in the U.S. and elsewhere. Uh, customers uh, repeatedly over and over again in studies show a preference for sustainable brands uh, and some in some cases a willingness to, to expend a, a greenium, as it were, quote unquote, <laughs> uh, for some of those sustainable products. And employees increasingly show a desire to work for companies that are aligned with the future that they, that they want to live in. Um, and, and this is, you know, happening across the board. So there's there's pressures from from all sorts of different stakeholder groups to account for ESG and sustainability more in business, uh, business and investment decisions, and that's starting to really take hold. So with that, with that very broad high level overview, I'm going to talk a bit about now the the asset owner perspective, what it is that's driving the the limited partners that invest in your fund, in, in many cases, to incorporate ESG and how they're how they're thinking about it. And so the oftentimes I think ESG is ignored in the context of asset allocation. And that was something that we, when I was working at Mercer and, and still the team at Mercer uh, focuses on this quite a bit. Uh, we really wanted to disabuse the market of that, of that sort of viewpoint uh, because it's not, it's not, not true. I mean, ESG factors or ESG risks or systemic risks as they're sometimes referred to, um, which have a very strong ESG flavor as it were. Uh, can have a very material impact on um, on asset allocation results, especially if you look forward in time. And so, what what we did at Mercer to address this was uh, develop a, a climate change um, conditioned uh, asset allocation model, which looked at two degree, three degree, and four degree scenario outcomes. And those those temperature numbers refer to the um, average temperature above pre industrial averages at twenty one hundred, which is sort of shorthand for uh, shorthand for a scenario uh, uh, nomenclature in, in the climate science literature. And what these models did is they took um, literature and, and, and modeling from the academic and policymaker community. We used integrated assessment models uh, from third parties as a means of forecasting what the economic effect of certain scenarios would be. And then we linked those economic estimates to asset class uh, return expectations and were able to quantify in, in basis points terms, the impact of each scenario on each asset class uh, over time. Um, and we found that this was an extremely powerful tool in engaging with asset owners and getting them to think more about the impacts of a systemic risk, uh, which has an ESG component like climate change on their portfolios. And it, it did indeed influence some of their asset allocation decisions in the long run. Um, and as you can see here, private equity is the orange bar on the right. Uh, there are some negative effects expected in the model portfolio, which we included 
in our most recent research, the Investing in the Time of Climate Change sequel from 2019, uh, which shows that you know, private equity can, a standard private equity allocation would have a negative effect from, uh, from a two degree, a three degree and a four degree scenario with, with differential impacts over time. Uh, and so that's something to, to keep in mind. Uh, from a manager selection standpoint, Increasingly, our, our clients are, are uh, in the asset owner community are looking for our viewpoints on the ESG characteristics of managers that they invest in. And to address this, back in 2008 or 2009, I may have the, the year off by, by one or two here, but um, we developed at Mercer a proprietary ESG rating mechanism. Uh, this is a qualitative rating scheme whereby our you know, managed researchers, the several hundred of them now uh, globally, where they all ask their, uh, their, their, the managers in their, in their remit, a, a series of questions around ESG and then qualitatively rate uh, their responses uh, based on ESG one, two, three, or four scale, where one is the best rating and four is the for is the worst, and what they're looking for when they're doing that evaluation is, you know, how strong, how strongly is our e ESG factors incorporated into idea generation? You know, are, are you actually making buy and sell decisions based on the ESG characteristics of the the companies that you're, you're investing in, or or is it really just a you know a checkbox exercise, or is it greenwashing even worse? <laughs> are there uh, you know, it, it, it does the team actually have some expertise and some training in, in how to identify ESG ideas um, or, or not? Uh, and that usually is the, the most influential sort of component of the ESG rating. But for certain strategies, portfolio construction can matter uh, even more. This is, you know, are, are how exposed are you to, uh, to regions with high exposure to, say, uh, physical climate risk or uh, with high exposure to transition risk from, from climate change? Are you carbon footprinting your portfolio? Uh, at, the, at the total portfolio level, um, does the risk team even even think about ESG at all? Uh, those are some of the questions that we'd look for for answers to. And then on the implementation and business management side, uh, a lot of the focus there on the implementation side is really around proxy voting and engagement. That's more of a, a public equity uh, public equity focused uh, component to the rating. However, it could also have bearing in, in private equity as well, where particularly where control stakes are held um, by the fund. And then business management is really, you know, where we look at how embedded ESG is across the firm, whether it is just a, a person uh, or a portfolio manager who's passionate about it, or if it actually is, you know, bought in by senior management. Uh, and, and, you know, are they a signatory, is the firm a signatory to the PRI and to other important initiatives? Um, and so all of these, these components go into what, how we assign the ratings. Um, and are increasingly, as I said, our asset owner clients are looking at these uh, ESG ratings and making their manager selection decisions. Uh, we also emphasize and have for a long time diversity and culture in our uh, in our manager research work. Uh, and in increasingly, you know, this this is becoming more and more emphasized by by our clients as well. Uh, and and as such, we're we're redoubling our efforts to collect more information from managers around the certain representation metrics and some of their policy positions around uh, diversity in their in their in their talent teams um and, and increasingly too you know we're, we're looking at at uh, is there group think in in the manager context are, are all of the the partners or the the the, the main investors the investor staff in the in the company are they all from the same business school do they all you know are they all friends from childhood do they all have the same sort of background is that something um, they, they all have the, the same ethnic background. They all men. I mean, those are all questions that we we look for and, and try to try to weed out because we think diversity leads to better better outcomes for our clients. And so increasingly, that's going to be a focus. I think you should look out for in, in manager research reviews uh, from consultants in particular. And, and so here's a, a look to uh, look through at, at what the ESG rating distribution looks like for for Mercer uh, at, across 4,500 different strategies rated across asset classes. Only about 20% um, get an ESG one or an ESG two rating. Those are the best ratings that uh, that Mercer affords. And so there's still quite a few out there at the ESG three, and and surprisingly, to be anyway, uh, at the ESG four level where they basically don't incorporate ESG at all. Um, and in private equity, there's a somewhat higher ratio in ESG one and two strategies, uh, but the most an important thing I think to mention there is the the high relatively high ratio of ESG one strategies in private equity that is, that is a reflection of the growing increase 
in impact oriented or impact theme strategies being offered by by managers and and you know you probably don't need to name all the names you've seen the headlines you know many of the major private equity firms have now launched impact oriented funds um, and increasingly you know more boutiques are, are coming online as well uh, and so I expect that to to increase over time um, especially as those those funds get uh, you know more of a track record and become more compelling to in terms of their size and their and their tenure to uh, institutional investors. So I'll talk a bit here now about the portfolio perspective and what you know what you can look for when you're uh, already invested and and say what what are some of the things that we could do to assess the ESG characteristics of our of our existing portfolio uh, rather than during the due diligence phase. And so one of the one of the things that, that some of our clients are looking at this is particularly relevant to uh, particular uh, private equity investors that are investing uh, in real assets but I, it's also uh, interesting to private equity firms that have companies with any sort of physical footprints um, whether it's brick and mortar retailer or, um, or anything to that uh, to that effect uh, if you have a, a physical uh, physical footprint that's of any you know meaningful amount uh, taking this approach to to risk assessment is is probably warranted here. And what we're what we're showing here is an example of a flood risk assessment that we that we did for a client in the UK, where uh, we mapped all of their all of their portfolio assets. Um, as you can see in the, the far left, they're represented by the the pink uh, pink dots and some of the other colored dots as well. And then we overlaid uh, a different different river flooding scenarios. So one was the sort of historical river flooding perspective and then climate adjusted perspectives um, based on you know, 2020, 2050 and 2080 future, future year projections. And then based on the delta between those you know, current and future projections, we were able to estimate and, and our, our own knowledge of the damage ratios uh, that, that exist increasing flooding will cause to, to buildings uh, based on their location, we were able to estimate financial damage to the all the buildings in the portfolio, and then uh, you know you can aggregate that and determine uh, is your current level of insurance purchasing adequate? Are there some resilience enhancements you can do to the individual buildings to to make them more resilient uh, to the the potential increase in flooding? Um, do you own perhaps? And this is this really is apparent at the beginning when you do the mapping. Do you own uh, buildings that uh, many of which are in a flood zone that promises to become much more um, flood intensive over time. And do you want to reduce that exposure? Are you comfortable with it? Are there community level enhancement mechanisms that could be uh, incentivized or, or you could work with local governments to, to implement? Uh, so there's all sorts of, all sorts of different um, the actions that could be, could be taken with, with the knowledge given by this sort of an analysis. Uh, we're also working uh, more qualitatively with uh, a number of a uh, number of organizations on their ERM frameworks and making sure that sustainability considerations are integrated therein. And this is really about I, I mentioned this in the prior slide where we think it's important to go that last mile and not just quantify, uh, as in this prior slide, uh, not just quantify the physical risk. Um, you know, how many additional meters or centimeters of depth in flooding you might expect and at one probability level, but to go the, the last mile and quantify that, what that probability shift means and that centimeters increase means in terms of financial, financial loss. Because if you don't financialize it, it's hard to incorporate, uh, incorporate it into your valuation or risk models. Um, and so similarly, you know, on a broader basis, taking, looking at the, the whole array of sustainability risks, not just physical climate risk, but, but uh, the whole array of them and figuring out which of those are quantifiable um, really helps, especially when it comes to the ARM process, because you know, being able to prioritize risk uh, through the ARM process is super important. And increasingly what we're seeing is that organizations are recognizing the sustainability trends, particularly as they relate to climate uh, or to social inequity and to, to other factors. Are, can be super material to financial outcomes. And so working through again to that last mile and making sure that you're at least uh, at a high level trying to quantify what those mean in financial terms is really is really valuable. Um, and then we have a series of other qualitative processes as well that help uh, help to you know pre preliminarily identify what those sustainability risks might be that you potentially would like to long list uh, before getting to that short list for action. And, and then we're, you know, we're also working on scenario analysis at the portfolio level. 
uh, relative to transition risk in particular. Um, and so climate transition risk is, is the risk of um, disruption to an incumbent industry or, or business uh, based on you know, future changes in climate policy or technology. And so, for example, if, if you're an oil uh, and gas company or a midstream um, asset of some sort and a carbon tax is implemented uh, with some sort of, yeah, at some point in the, in the fossil fuel value chain, it will have an impact on your bottom line. Uh, and, and understanding what that impact uh, will be is, is part of what this modeling is intended intended to do and that that uh, so oil and gas is the most obvious uh, sort of uh, sentinel uh, industry uh, for this kind of risk however there's a lot of um, you know many many industries are carbon intensive or, or have a high reliance on carbon uh, based fuel for for inputs and so that this has broad relevance uh, to to a whole host of different different entities um, and so what, what we do is we look at the, the range of scenarios from 1.5 degrees all the way up to four degrees, depending on, uh, depending on the, the client's risk profile and preferences. Um, and then we try to quantify, as I mentioned earlier, use, using scenario-based integrated assessment models or climate economy, model, emo, climate economy models, variables that matter to the financial outcomes of those, uh, of those entities or the portfolio of entities as the case may be in, in this instance. Um, and these tools, integrated assessment models, produce a whole, whole, whole host of outputs that uh, can be very useful to uh, portfolio financial modeling. Um, again, if, if the portfolio is energy related, uh, these models are very much uh, uh, built to, many of them are, are built to understand and analyze the energy systems. And so you can take you know, energy demand or energy price pr projections or emission projections or carbon price projections and embed those into uh, the financial values of, of broader um, uh, you know, energy focused portfolios. But if it's a more diversified portfolio, uh, you can look at impacts economically uh, at the at the region or at the sector using GDP or GVA gross value added factors as a means of of understanding what the impact of of, of these climate scenarios might be on the sectoral level output, uh, which then can be a, a, a useful input to uh, to the scenario model. Um, so what what we've done is, relative to diversified portfolios is is build. Uh, through our selection of scenario models, build connections between those economic variables and expected returns. If it's an asset allocation model or cash flow statements or balance sheets or income statements as the case may be for uh, sector specific analyses and, and then carry those through into uh, return impacts uh, or equity, um, equity valuation impacts. And this can apply at the portfolio level as well as I'll, I'll mention later on at the, at the asset level, depending on, on the desired level of granularity. And so it's also important, uh, to, so in addition to, we've talked about the asset owner perspective, we've talked about uh, the general general partner portfolio level perspective, and now we're gonna talk about the, you know, what, what a general partner might wanna do when it comes to asset level due diligence or understanding uh, once an asset is already owned, how to improve the ESG characteristics of that of that owned owned company. And here I'll talk a bit more about the valuation mechanisms that I just talked about. This is a different visual, which more or less equates to the, the same thing that I just described, but I think it's helpful to go through in this additional level of detail. Um, so what you can do with a scenario analysis, particularly related to climate, I mean, this may apply to other trends as well, but I think it's most, most applicable at this point to, to climate risk, is you can take those scenario variables, whether they're uh, cli physical climate risk related or transition climate risk related, and relate them again to uh, some key drivers of the financial outcomes of the company, whether it's the price of, of inputs, the price of outputs, uh, the volume of inputs or outputs, uh, the cost of individual units, um, impacts on, on CapEx or asset values are all potentially derived from these scenario models. Uh, we can then carry those through into forecasted income statements or cash flows, uh, and then use those to either adjust the um, the discounted cash flow model that you might be using to value your companies, or if in a debt situ situation, if, if there are any private debt uh, managers out there, um, to adjust the credit rating or, or the uh, the bond valuation, as the as the case may be, of the of the particular asset in question, and then 
excuse me, the, some of these uh, these individual portfolio or individual company level evaluations can be aggregated uh, to develop portfolio level um, estimates as well. So many different ways to to peel the potato here, <laughs> as it were. Uh, so you know, important to to understand the various vicissitudes of this process and how it could be applied to your uh, to your specific context. I'm happy to answer more questions for that if if, if useful at the end. And then another another factor too that we've increasingly been emphasizing in our engagements with with corporate and and investor clients is the importance of talent. And this is you know I think under under emphasized perhaps in ESG uh, ESG circles other than the diversity element, which is of course super uh, super important. Uh, but the broader effect of of you know managing uh, managing talent for sustainability. Is um, is potentially very strong, especially for businesses that are not that capital intensive, but are much more focused on technology and, and people. Um, and so, what we've developed through our Mercer talent business, and, uh, and which and the broader human resources related consulting that Mercer does, is uh, sort of top down and bottom up approaches to incorporating sustainability uh, into overall corporate processes. Um, and there's a change, an element of change management here too that, that comes into play. But essentially, what happens is uh, in, in through these engagements is that from the top down, um, the the team engages with the management of the company as well as potentially the the owners of the company, as, uh, again as the case may be, uh, to articulate what the corporate purpose is. And in many cases, you know those the, the purpose extends beyond just making money and into some sort of uh, social or environmental uh, goal creation. Uh, this then needs to translate into corporate culture uh, and inform strategy and and be embedded in in leadership incentives and, and other other practices um, and developing the the policies and processes needed uh, from the top down from a management management perspective to embed that refined purpose into the overall operations. Uh, it takes takes a lot of work and, and it takes a, a lot of buy-in from senior management, but it can pay dividends in in the form of greater, uh, or sorry, I should say lower employee turnover, uh, a happier workforce, a more productive workforce, um, you know, really, really valuable things. Uh, but importantly, those top-down changes need to be reinforced with bottom-up approaches. And so we also invest typically in these projects in uh, a lot of communication and a lot of dialogue with with the employees, uh, and this may entail tangibly, you know, various workshops, many of which would be online in this current environment, but uh, hopefully someday again in person. And then um, working with employees to co-create what is ultimately a you know more purposeful uh, and engaged uh, environment for working. Uh, and, and aligning uh, a long time alongside these top-down changes with uh, with the purpose of the organization. So, you know, that was a lot of information. Um, I'm going to take down the screen for now. I may reshare as questions come in. But I I, I hope that um, I hope that you found it useful. And and Sheena, please let me know if any questions come in that that I can answer. Thank you. So we do have one question from Tony Pow. I'm so sorry if I mispronounced your last name. Um, their question is, how do institutional investors view investing in niche funds with impact investing themes versus established funds looking to raise an impact fund? That is a great question and one which is um, uh, challenging to answer for a few reasons, but, but basically the, the, broad, the broad trend that, that I have noticed is that there's a, a more comfort, I would say, amongst institutional investors to invest in funds that are being offered by established managers, in part because even, even if those established managers, you know, large established managers don't have uh, a track record of impact investing, they, the, the firm and the, and the brand name carries, carries a lot of weight, certainly in, in board meetings, and uh, it, it might be easier for, for institutional investors to, to make, you know, to pull the trigger on those kinds of allocations, you, again, with, without a sort of specific impact oriented track record, um, than it would be to invest in a niche or smaller uh, fund that is offering a first time impact, uh, impact strategy. And, uh, you know, they, I've been doing a lot of work or ha had been doing a lot of work on emerging manager programs. So how, how to invest more 
in new and and smaller managers where where many of the you know best ideas uh, can arise. Uh, you know, good ideas are not are not uh, don't only come from the largest funds, and it's uh, it's challenging. It's challenging. The institutional landscape is you know the, there are uh, there are um, how should I put it? <laughs> there are guardrails in place in the institutional space uh, for a reason. Um, you know, a lot of governance uh, is 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 in the way of making uh, management manager selection decisions for you know deliberately, and it can be challenging to you know to get over some of those hurdles without again without the uh, the brand name that that some of the larger firms have. Uh, but that doesn't mean that you know there aren't some asset owners out there that that are that. Um, that are, I'm sorry, I got lost in my tense here, but there, there are some asset allocators out there that are allocating to um, smaller impact oriented funds and, and that are more willing to take uh, well, what, what some might view as taking a chance on a, on a, smaller, on a smaller fund. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's generally harder to, to go that route. Okay. Do we have any more questions? Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A function. I gave them so much information, Sheena, that they just don't have any questions. It's great. It's possible. <laughs> Amazing presentation. Oh, wow. <laughs> So if, if there are no questions, you know, I'm, I'm happy to take them after if they want to send them to you or to Michael. And if you want to email them to me, I'm happy to, um, you know, engage with those questions offline as, as useful. Okay. So I will go ahead um, for all of the attendees that are listening. I did put some information in the chat. Um, what I will do as well is I will follow up with contact information for Alex and then our CEO, Michael Rivera, as well as me. And so if you have any questions for Alex, just go ahead and send them my way. And then I will forward them to Alex and connect you to him. So that way he can answer your questions if you weren't comfortable with answering them during today's webinar. Um, the... Recording of today's webinar will be available on our ACGLA TV channel uh, via our YouTube tomorrow. Uh, for all of our member attendees tonight, uh, you did receive a complete registration list of event attendees. You should have received that at 4 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time via email from us. If you didn't receive it, please go ahead and send me an email. Um, and thank you so much, Alex, for being a phenomenal speaker. Um, and your presentation was amazing. Um, yeah. Thank you, Sia. Well, if no one has any other questions, we are going to go ahead and end the webinar. Thank you so much for joining us. Oh, wait, I believe we have a question. Uh, Claire, do you have a question? I saw somebody raise their hand. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Alex. Thank you. Have a good rest of your day.